Remember, man, thou art dust, and unto dust thou shalt return. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. The greatest feasts of the church have periods of preparation placed before them. Once upon a time, the church fasted on all the vigils of important solemn feasts, and the priests wore purple as well. That's how important it is to fast before a major feast. Well, Christmas is such an important feast, it has four weeks of Advent, and Easter has six weeks of Lent. That's the vigil, as it were, of these feast days. So that means Easter is the greatest of our feasts, so it needs the greatest preparation. We can see this even in the Mass itself. Even though Christmas is not over, but is extended through time and space through the church. The church is the continued incarnation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But the Paschal mystery of Holy Week and Easter is actually represented, made present again, daily in the Mass. Just as Mass requires some preparation also, like fasting, so too should the most glorious events of our Lord's life that are represented in the Mass itself require preparation. Now, Lent is that preparation, obviously. So it's so important that it's represented in every Mass, and Mass needs preparation, then so does the feast. As a period of preparation for Easter, and ultimately for heaven, the overall goal of Lent is to seek complete detachment from sin and all creatures of this world. Sin comes from seeking things of this world over God. The thing we may be seeking may not be bad in itself, but we're seeking it over God. Adam and Eve lost their focus on God, we could say, and taking and eating the forbidden fruit. The fruit was a good thing, but they lost the verticality. They lost order. They forgot God. Now, attachments follow upon sin. When we sin, we become attached to things. Can't let go. Hence, the goal of Lent is not to see how much penance we can do, even though this can be done well for the salvation of souls. Rather, Lent is to seek complete detachment of the will and mortification of the understanding if you could be completely detached by the end of Lent, you would be a saint. God would answer your prayers and you'd work miracles. Now, these are things then we strive for. Attachment of the will and mortification of the understanding. St. Teresa of Jesus says, There can never be solid virtue in a soul that is detached to its own will. So how can we detach? Well, we pray. We fast. We give alms, as the gospel recommends. Since we're body and soul, we do things with our body to help our souls. They go together. Thus, we have today fasting and abstinence. Now, of these, fasting seems to be the characteristic penance of Lent. After all, Lent is 40 days long in imitation of our Lord's fast in the desert. It should not be necessary to show the importance and advantages of fasting. The sacred scriptures, both the Old and the New Testaments, are filled with praises of this holy practice. The traditions of every nation of the world testify to the universal veneration in which fasting has been held throughout time. It seems that there is not a people and hardly a religion which is not impressed with this conviction that man may appease his God by subjecting his body to penance. St. Basil, St. John Chrysostom, St. Jerome, St. Gregory the Great point out that the commandment put upon our first parents in the earthly paradise was one of abstinence. Don't eat of this fruit. And that it was by their not exercising this virtue that they brought every kind of evil upon themselves and upon their children. Clearly, practicing fasting and abstinence is a very effective way of overcoming evils, 
of expiating sins, not only in our own life, but in the world as a whole. Doctors have shown, finally, that fasting regularly is healthy for the body because it helps to cleanse the body of toxic materials. This is why fasting is oftentimes painful. It hurts because there's all those toxins inside. But this is true on the spiritual level as well. Fasting helps cleanse the mystical body of sinful toxins. Listen to Venerable Mother Mariana of Quito. She left this in her last testament to her sisters. She says, Beloved daughters and sisters, I bequeath to you self-denial and holy penance. Oh, do love penance. It is an antidote against evil passions and even healthy for the body. That was written way back in the early 1600s. They knew it back then. It's healthy for the body. You live longer when you fast. Armed with such motives, we should willingly seek to fast as all the saints have done before us. Let's not be gloomy or sad about this practice, but joyful, knowing of its most healthful and salutary benefits. Again, let's listen to a saint. John of the Cross says, To come to enjoy what you have not, you must go by a way in which you enjoy not. To come to enjoy what you have not, you must go by a way in which you enjoy not. To come to the possession you have not, you must go by a way in which you possess not. To come to be what you are not, you must go by a way in which you are not. St. John of the Cross. Lent uh, is that which we enjoy not, possess not, and are not. But what's the result? We become something we have not been. A saint. Although the church only requires us to fast on this day and Good Friday, we should consider fasting a little more, huh? Like every Friday during Lent. Pope St. Celestine V, before becoming Pope, would practice several Lents throughout the year, something like five. How edifying. Let's take that same generous spirit and apply it, at least in some small way, to our penances this Lent. Let's be generous in seeking to expiate our sins and those of the whole world. Now, I leave you with one last thought. At Christmas, we reflected on the trajectory of how God works with souls. As put on display in that mysterious book, of the scriptures, the Canticle of Canticles. Recall how we found in this book a repeated use of verbs having the first person pronoun as their object or at least their indirect object. And so the book starts out at the very beginning. Let him kiss me, kiss me with the kiss of his mouth. A few verses later we hear, draw me, we will run after thee in the odor of thy ointments. Again, a little later, we hear this telling line. Show me, O thou whom my soul loveth, where thou feedest. Kiss me, draw me, show me. Since Christmas, we have explored this trajectory a little more, adding on these phrases. Bring me into the wine cellar and put charity and order in me and stay me up with flowers compass me about with apples because I languish with love today let's add a few more to these bring me into the wine cellar and put charity and order in me and stay me up and compass me about so today let's add a few more that are relevant to the season of Lent the next verse goes like this. His hand, his left hand is under my head and his right hand shall embrace me, embrace me. And it goes on. Behold, my beloved speaketh to me. Arise, make haste, my love, my dove, my beautiful one, and come and show me, show me thy face. Let thy voice sound in my ears for thy voice is sweet and thy face comely. 
Embrace me, speak to me, show me thy face. Now, when we enter Lent with some seriousness, such things start to come to pass. Good Lord speaks to us, he embraces us, he gives us graces, he shows us his face. But we must add one more phrase from the canticle of canticles, namely, catch us the little foxes that destroy the vines, for our vineyard has flourished. There it is. Catch us, catch in me the little foxes that block this loving union. Here is the purpose of Lent summarized. We are offered a deeper union with his majesty, but only if we go out in the desert and catch the little foxes inside our souls that diminish and destroy our virtues and prevent divine union. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.